So friends, how are you doing at the end of this particular week? <laughs> the election day was only five days ago, but it feels like it's been about a month. And whatever your political leanings might be, it is safe to say that this past week for all of us have been has been a roller coaster of emotions, anxiety, hopefulness, disappointment, anger, frustration, relief, elation. Every time that we watched on that electoral map, we watched one of the states turn either red or blue, it would bring up this surge of those emotions. I know that some of you have tried to stay away from watching the returns 24-7 on the TV because it was just simply too stressful. And pretty much everybody that I have talked to in this past week would say that's how they've been feeling. They've been feeling stressed. I was on a Zoom call uh, on Thursday with Presbyterian leaders from throughout the country. And even though we weren't talking about the election per se, <laughs> of course it was on everybody's mind and you could sense that everybody's nerves were just stretched tight. And if there had been an announcement <laughs> in the middle of that meeting of the results, there would have been 386 people that, had, would, that had erupted into joy or perhaps cried out in despair or both. <laughs> both probably with the number of folks that were on that call. Everybody is feeling some kind of way right about now, even if we're not all feeling the same kind of way. But the fact is that we're all feeling something, and that is to be totally expected. Because, after all, we are emotional beings. We have feelings. And the more important and the more consequential something is, the stronger we feel about it. Now, if I were a psychologist or a social scientist, uh, I could give you all kinds of good reasons and explanations about where our feelings come from and why they are important and how they work and what to do with them when they threaten to overwhelm us. But I'm not either one of those things. So the question that I want to think about with you is this. How does the fact that we are emotional beings Help us to know God better. Help us to experience God more fully. Help us to be in deeper relationship with God. And the place that I want to start with that question is that if we are emotional beings and we are created in God's image, does that mean that God also has feelings, that God is also an emotional being. Makes sense, right, that God would be. But that question, is God an emotional being, has a bit of an edge to it. Because when we say that someone is being emotional, oh, you know, he's just being emotional, or she's just having an emotional moment right now. What, we're, what we really mean is that they're overreacting or that they are not in control of their feelings or that they are being irrational in some way. And certainly, God is not like that, is he? There's a Christian doctrine that uh, has been expressed by the theologians of old, going all the way back to the church fathers and up through the Protestant reformers, John Calvin and, and beyond that. And it's called the impassibility of God. 
the impassibility of God. And that doesn't mean <laughs> that you can't get past God or that God is passive, because it comes from the Latin word possibilis, which is related to the word passion, as in the passion of Christ. And what the impassibility of God means is that God does not suffer pain or pleasure from another being. Technically, the way it's stated is that God does not experience emotional change in any way. God does not suffer. Now, this is a controversial doctrine, as you might expect, especially with the theologians of new, <laughs> as opposed to the theologians of old, who want to argue that if God is incapable or not willing to suffer, then God can't identify with us. And we can't relate to God. And it's also controversial because if you re read through scripture, there are all kinds of emotions attributed to God. We're gonna look at some of those. Uh, and I don't have a Bible here because I would be flipping like crazy. I'm going to just show some of those scriptures uh, up on the display here. Some emotions that are attributed to God, beginning with love. Now, before somebody says love is not an emotion, I'll counter by saying love is not simply an emotion, but it is certainly something that we feel. And God feels love, according to the scripture. The most, perhaps the best known scripture in all the world is what? John three sixteen. for God so loved the world. Obviously, God expresses love all throughout the scriptures. Like this wonderful, passage in Romans chapter 8, 39, nothing, and I am convinced that nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Or earlier in the book of Romans chapter 5, verse 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Of course, 1 John chapter 4, God is love. And God has shown his love to us in giving us Christ. But God's love is not something that just shows up in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament in, as well. Prophet Jeremiah, in, in Jeremiah, the Lord says, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. Or Isaiah chapter 43, verse 4, You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Or again, Psalm 86, 15, You, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. But that verse reminds us that there's another facet to God's emotions, and that is anger. And anger is often described in, God's anger is often described in the scripture in the most colorful language. Like in Exodus 32, verse 10, God is so frustrated with the people of Israel that he says to Moses, now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And then in Isaiah 54, again, in overflowing wrath for a moment, I hid my face from you, the Lord says, but with everlasting love, 
I have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. There's another word, love. Anger and love, and then the other important word is compassion. As in Psalm 103, verse 13, a father has compassion, as a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him, which means for those who honor him. Or Isaiah 49, 15, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? And then the Lord compares himself to that mother. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. And there are many other emotions attributed to the Lord as well. Jealousy, that's a troublesome one. But Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9 says, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. And that's not the only place where God says that about God's self. There's grief and regret. Genesis 6, 6, the Lord was sorry that he made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Or Jeremiah 14, verse 17, the Lord says, My eyes run down with tears night and day for the virgin daughter. My people is struck down with a crushing blow with a very grievous wound. And it's not just Israel that God cries over in Jeremiah. In verse 48, 31, Therefore I wail for Moab. I wail, God says, for Moab. I cry out for all Moab. For the people of Kir Heres I mourn. And then on the other side of the spectrum is delight, God's delight. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 9, The Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. It's an emotional word, delight. Uh, it doesn't say, I chose to prosper your ancestors. Of course, God did. But it says, I delighted to prosper your ancestors. Isaiah 62, verse 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. And Zephaniah 3, verse 17, the Lord will delight in you in gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Some translations say he will rejoice over you with dancing. God dances in his joy. And we could go on and on with scripture like this. The point is clearly that the impassibility of God doesn't mean that God doesn't have emotions. And it's not just the second person of the Trinity, you know, God in the flesh, Jesus, the Son of God, who feels things. And Jesus wept. Jesus felt compassion. Jesus rejoiced. All those words are attributed to Jesus. But it's also the God of the Old Testament, God the Father, the triune God, who expresses all these different emotions. Now, this does not deny the doctrine of the impassibility of God. And for those who are interested in understanding how that, those relate and that whole d doctrine, and want to dig into, the, into it. And it's, it's not easy, and it's troublesome, and it's important. But I'd recommend one excellent article called The Impassable God Who Cried by a theologian by the name of Amos Winarto Oe. And if you just Google that title, it's on the screen, The Impassable God Who Cried. 
and make sure that you find it on, you'll find it on the Gospel Coalition website. It's a couple pages long and you will find a very good presentation of this doctrine and looking at how it relates to God's emotions. But really that's just a footnote to this message because the important point that I want to make is that God is passionate. God is passionate. In the scripture, God's nostrils blaze with anger. God is a jealous husband. God is a, like a nursing mother. God is moved to compassion. And being in relationship with this passionate God is a stormy and intense and dangerous and wild and wonderful ride. I'll be honest, you know, sometimes when I'm reading scripture, I'll get to a certain passage and I'll just stop and say, really, God? <laughs> and, and it feels to me like God's response to really God is, yes, really. I am for real. And to love me, to be in relationship with me, like long, loving anyone, is sometimes risky. It's hard. You have to work at it. But there's nothing better. God is passionate. And God is also passionate about us and about the world that he created and about justice and righteousness and truth and grace. God is passionate about caring for the poor and the weak and the suffering and the foreigner and the prisoner and the orphan and the widow. God is passionate and over and over in scripture we read that God is compassionate. Come passion literally means with passion god feels with us to feel with another person is what compassion means god feels with us and that means that there is nothing that you can feel that god doesn't understand and there's nothing you feel that you can't express to God. In fact, the impassibility of God, that how we feel and what we do will never change who God is. That's my own sort of definition of that doctrine. How we feel and what we do will never change who God is means that there nowhere is it more safe or saving for us to express our feelings than to God. What do we do with the roller coaster of emotions that we've all felt this week and that are we're likely to feel in one way or another for, you know, weeks to come, months, years maybe. You know, 2020 isn't over yet. Same thing that we do with all of our feelings. We pour out our hearts to God, knowing that God also feels and that God has some feelings about this election, for example, God cares about who is president and who sits on the Supreme Court and who our local judges are and who sits on the Hamilton County Commission. And God cares how his bride, the church, has impacted those elections. And God cares even more about how we the representatives of Christ and witnesses to his kingdom are now reacting and relating in the aftermath of the election. Know also 
that God's feelings about those things may not be the same as your feelings. Certainly, God is not anxious or worried about the outcomes and what happens next. Because God can see the end from the beginning. God's own good purposes will not be thwarted. Because the God, the call and election of God is irrevocable, it says in Scripture. Because God is always and in all ways able to do far more abundantly than all we can do and ask. God is passionate for God's people, for God's kingdom, for all of creation that God has created. Amen. Friends, I'm grateful once again that we're able to offer this time of worship with you and uh, to you and that wherever you are watching it uh, at home or whatever time you're watching it, that uh, you have received this worship offering from folks here at North Church, from the worship team. And also to say, you know, there are ways that we can connect with one another even before we're able to gather again in the sanctuary. And those, some of those ways through social media will be uh, on the display here at the end of this video. But I really wanna encourage you that if you're not joining in on the Zoom call on Sunday morning, I know it's not like being in the same room, but there, it is live and we are able to uh, interact with one another. And we love having folks that 
visit us or are joining us from another part of the country even. And we would welcome you to be with us. The way, the way you get the link for that Zoom call is by uh, signing up for the weekly e-newsletter, the e-chimes we call it, or uh, by going to the Facebook page and you'll see uh, a link there to the worship guide, which gives you the outline of this service, worship time, and also the link to join by Zoom. And then we, we watch the video together. And we're hoping that there's a time coming that we'll be able to watch the video together, a small group of us socially distanced uh, in the sanctuary. And we'll let you know about that. But let's continue to reach out in all the ways that we have to be in contact, in connection with one another. But now, friends, let us go out into this week, into this world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. And God's people and all people say, Amen.